Welcome to the fourth meeting of Session 6 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items 8 and 9 in private. Is the committee content to take items 8 and 9 in private? Yes, sir. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number 2. Uh, today we have uh, before us uh, George Adam, MSP, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, to give evidence regarding uh, to the work of the Scottish Government and how it relates to this committee. Mr Adam is accompanied by uh, certainly two officials at the moment uh, who are all appearing remotely. Uh, we've got Stephen McGregor, the Head of the Parliament and Legislation Unit, and Susan Herbert, the Head of the Subordinate Legislation Team in the Parliament and the Legislation Unit. And we are hoping to be joined by, well, with, uh, by Rachel Rayner, the Deputy Legislation Coordinator in the Scottish Government's Legal Directorate. Uh, first of all, may I welcome you all to the meeting. And I'd uh, like to uh, welcome uh, the Minister to his new role. Um, the Minister will be aware that uh, this uh, previous committee had a, an excellent working relationship uh, with uh, the Minister, and certainly we are uh, keen to ensure that that continues in this uh, parliamentary session. So, with that, I'd like to ask the Minister if he wishes to make any opening remarks. Yes, I would, Convener, and thank you very much for asking me along here today. I, too, hope that we have a good working relationship, because it's important that uh, I, as a Minister for Parliament, have a a good working relationship, particularly with this committee, because I'm aware of the work you do, because I used to be on the committee myself, so I know how important it is to make the cogs of this place actually work. And uh, I'd like to congratulate you, convener, on uh, being coming convener of the committee. We've known each other for a very, very long time, um, although we do support rival teams in Renfrewshire, and we can leave that argument for another day. Uh, but uh, we've been friends for a very long time, so it's good to see you there as well. And I hope to, uh, I like to welcome everyone else who is uh, new to the committee, or those that are continuing on from the role in the past. The, the committee itself, I believe, has an important role in scrutinising all the legislation that goes through this uh, building. And in the past year, it's been particularly challenging for you. It's been a difficult uh, year with all the legislation that's gone through. But there's been a full legislative programme, and we're still addressing many of the challenges that we're dealing with with uh, COVID. And uh, I recognised from the feedback from the committee that the government has improved its processes. Policy notes now are more accessible. Outstanding uh, commitments met, a uh, huge improvement that will continue, and improvement management of volumes of SSIs. Improvement of the number of SSIs reported. 13% of the 396 SSIs laid in 2020-21, majority in the last quarter. Not complacent. I'm not complacent that we obviously want to see further improvement with that as we continue. And uh, I provide clerks with forward look of SSIs to be laid in the following two weeks has been ongoing. I need to avoid, where possible, breaches of the 28-day laying period. I know that's a thing that particularly vexes the committee, and uh, it's one that uh, the ones that we've had recently have unfortunately been regrettably unavoidable. But I'm aware of the issue, and I'm aware that I want to try and get things better. But what's happened recently has been systematic. Of the 25 breaches out of the 143 negative SSIs laid in last year, around 17% in total were like that. Not good enough, but still we'll try and move it better than that. I, I'd like to ensure that the committee receives information on the volumes of legislation that comes to Parliament and can expect to receive uh, from the government on a regular basis. And I welcome the views in the previous committee made in their legacy report on the consideration of the Scottish Law Commission bills. I'm pleased to note that the announcement for the programme for government, the Movable Transactions Bill, will be a Scottish Law Commission Bill, and there'll be other ones as well that we're committed to in the programme for government uh, that will be part of that, and I know that's another major issue for the committee as well. So I look forward to hearing the views of the committee. I look forward to working with you in the future, and uh, I hope to have a similar relationship to the one you had with my predecessor. You know, I always find it, I've known Mr Day for years, I find it difficult that people find him charming, but uh, obviously you all had a good working relationship with him, so uh, I'm quite happy to try and keep that going. If you didn't, then I'm quite happy to make it better. On that, convener, I'll leave it over to yourselves. OK, thank you very much for that, Minister. Uh, Minister, I'm going to open up the, some questioning. And the, the first one, actually, just it's regarding a, a late 
um, SSI that came into the committee uh, last night, and it is on the agenda for uh, for this morning, which we will discuss later. It's the Social Security Residence Requirements Afghanistan Scotland Regulations 2021. Oh. Uh, now, clearly, um, the situation in Afghanistan is urgent and pressing. Um, and so, certainly as a committee, we're, we would be keen to just understand, are you anticipating uh, any more um, instruments re uh, regarding Afghanistan in the, and certainly in the weeks and months ahead? As you've already mentioned, Convener, it's quite a difficult situation mm. and it's constantly moving, but uh, I wouldn't like to be doing uh, a last-minute SSI like that to yourselves unless it was n completely necessary. And in this case, I believe it was. But uh, whenever possible, we'll try and make sure you get things cited well in advance. OK. Well, thank you. Um, certainly, of all the, uh, the COVID SSIs laid in the past 18 months, uh, how many uh, separate SSIs are still live and how many have been superseded or are no longer used? Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't get you that information right now, convener, but I could get it to you back in writing, no problem. Uh, obviously, I, I'm performing without a net here today as I've only got a couple of officials, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I can get that information to the committee as soon as possible. Okay, well, thank you. Um, in session five, the, the committee regularly highlighted to ministers the quality of the drafting of secondary legislation and saw a general reduction of errors, which is something that you touched upon in your opening comments. Uh, the government has clearly, clearly been under pressure to bring uh, forward uh, legislation quickly uh, to respond to the coronavirus. And uh, certainly, what, in terms of your own, um, your own thoughts about this, and what, is the, what are you planning to do to ensure that the quality of SSIs remains high? I think, uh, as you've already said, Convener, it's important that we do have a clarity in the legislation. I know there has been times over the past year where there has been uh, difficulties with definitions on various things. Uh, and, and sometimes these kind of things can be unavoidable, uh, whether it be in the political debate itself or whether it actually be in the legal realms themselves. So uh, we have tried all the time to ensure that we've got legislation that is uh, clear and you're able to be able to understand it. Uh, and I think it is extremely important that on every occasion that I do that, that we try to bring it as clearly as possible. There's been a couple of issues uh, that have happened over the definition of concepts, as I've already said, which has caused some confusion. And I've got no simple solution to this issue. There is no simple solution, but it's something that, I'll, as Minister, I'll strive to try and make everything as clear as possible, because I'm a great believer in the simpler you make everything, the easier we're all going to get on. Okay, thank you. Uh, and certainly our predecessor committee welcomed the Scottish Government's work in uh, meeting almost all of the historic commitments by the end of the last parliamentary session. And some of those historic commitments that did go back uh, more than one parliamentary session, as you'll be very much aware. So, so what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure it actually meets its commitments swiftly in this session to ensure that the problem uh, does not resurface? Are you talking about the 28-day uh, issue? Or uh, no, no. It's, uh, there were a number of uh, instruments where uh, there had been uh, issues or technical issues with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, they well, the quality of SSIs again then? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, no. I'll be doing not most to make sure that you do get the information and uh, it's inevitable with the sheer volume of what was done that mistakes are made, people are human, uh, things uh, don't go, do go wrong. But we'll try and make sure that we have a process that you get it as accurately as possible, uh, the SSIs that are laid in front of you. OK. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm going to hand over to Graham Simpson. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, welcome, Minister, and I welcome your um, comments at the start about uh, the relationship that you want with this committee. Um, certainly when I, when I was the convener, I did have a, a, a good relationship with uh, Graham Day. You'll, you'll be horrified to hear. And, uh, but, I know but, how working one was, not easy. Yeah. Um, but also his predecessor, Joe Fitzpatrick, um, I found them both uh, very, very good to work with. Um, and when they appeared at this committee, um, it, you know, we had a very co cordial relationship and they knew what this committee's requirements were so that that said um, we had some correspondence with you last week um, round about 
the, the vaccine passport debate uh, and the proposal from the Scottish Government um, to introduce the requirement for vaccine certification uh, at certain events. Um, you, you, you'll have seen our an annual report from the last session uh, where we expressed some, uh, shall we say, concern um, over the, num the number um, of uh, made affirmative regulations that we're going through. And for anyone that's watching, that is where the government basically brings in a law without it being scrutinised by the parliament. Uh, the scrutiny comes later. Um, and most parliamentarians would accept there's been a need for that during, during COVID, but there's been a large number of that. So we wrote to you, as you know, uh, around about this uh, proposal for uh, vaccine passports. That might not be the term you use, but that's, that's the term I use. We, we know what we're talking about. Um, you, you wrote back to us on the 9th of September, so it's quite a quick turnaround. Um, and you, in your letter, essentially said that if, if there were to be regulations, and, the, and, and there would have to be regulation if this is to come in, your view is that that made affirmative procedure should still apply. Despite there being weeks to prepare for this, so I'm, I'm asking you here, is that still your position? I think they made affirmative. Uh, I don't have the same view on the made affirmative uh, scenario as you do. It still get offers a level of scrutiny through this committee uh, with regards to that as well. Uh, as I kept saying, Mr Simpson, uh, parliamentary scrutiny and accountability is extremely important. And I agree that wherever possible, we should give parliament the chance to scrutinise the regulations before they come into effect. However, there needs to be some form of balance between parliamentary scrutiny and the need to maximise ministers' ability to finalise these decisions as close to the relevant time to account for the fact that situations change at the moment rapidly. Look, we're living in an unprecedented times and over the past 18 months there have been times where government have had to deal with things rapidly. And there are a number of moving parts in the decision-making process as well as all the emerging data that we're currently receiving. So there are a number of issues that are being worked through in the design and the operation of the scheme, including how medical exemptions could be considered. So as I outlined in my letter uh, to the committee, there's an urgent need for this measure to be implemented to provide an additional layer of protection in a limited set of higher risk settings. Now, in all honesty, uh, I, I do want to work with the committee uh, on this issue, but with some of the COVID regulations, as has been the case over the last 18 months, I can't make any guarantees that we will not be not using the made affirmative uh, uh, process, which I have said in an answer to one of your colleagues, Mr Stewart, when he asked a question in Parliament a couple of weeks ago. OK. Um, that sounds a, like there might be some movement, so the you might not necessarily use the made affirmative I procedure. Can, I can guarantee one way or the other. Uh, I think uh, there will be a good chance that we'll be using the made affirmative in some of these regulations as they come forward. But uh, as I said in the past, where possible, I will try and work with the committee in a way that will be acceptable to yourselves. But on many of the issues where there is a time scale and we need to deliver something, there are times. We had a debate last week in Parliament with regards to COVID certification, and there was a vote in Parliament as well. So we do uh, have the, we've already had one level of scrutiny within the Parliament as is. Well, well, we had a two hour debate about some something that we knew precious little of. We certainly didn't know the details and that's where scrutiny comes in. Uh, and, and I know you know that. Um, so I don't think that that debate counts as scrutiny. The scrutiny would come when you actually tell people, tell Parliament, what it is you're proposing to do, if indeed you, you proceed with this. You mentioned in your letter, um, and I'll just read, read it out, um, you say, I absolutely accept the made affirmative procedure must only be used when the test for using it is, is set out in Schedule 19 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 is met. Um, so if we have a look at Schedule 19 of the Coronavirus Act 2020. And, uh, paragraph 1.1 says 
the Scottish ministers may by regulations make provision for the purpose of preventing, protecting against, controlling or providing a public health response to the incidence or spread of infection or contamination in, in Scotland. Um, so that, gi that gives you the power to, to do all this stuff. But there are some checks on that um, also contained in the, in the Act, um, one of which is under uh, 4A, um, where it says regulations un under paragraph 1.1, which I've just read out to you, may not include provision enabling the imposition of a special restriction or requirement unless, so that could include vaccine passports, unless the regulations are made in response to a serious and imminent threat to public health, so it has to be both serious and imminent, or imposition of the restriction or requirement is expressed to be contingent on there being such a threat at the time when it is imposed. Now, my point to you would be, given that the First Minister announced her intention to bring in vaccine passports a couple of weeks ago, and it wouldn't, they wouldn't actually come in uh, until the start of October, that doesn't meet those tests, in my view. That, that is not serious and imminent. That is, when, when she announced it, it was not serious and imminent. Uh, and if we go on to the second point, that there being such a threat at the time when it is imposed, we cannot possibly know what the threat is in a couple of weeks' time. So that's why I would argue that you should not be using this procedure. You should be allowing prior scrutiny of whatever it is you're proposing so that we get this right. Again, Mr Simpson, we're here to the difference in interpretation. From my own point of view, I would say that the situation, the key groups that we're trying to ensure are vaccinated through because of the COVID certification, it is important and serious that we do, uh, there is a health scare there as well. And my interpretation would be the opposite of what you've just said, because there's these key groups that we need to be vaccinated. And the whole idea of the COVID uh, certification is to ensure that these key groups are indeed vaccinated and safe. OK, I think we're, we're, we're going to have to um, strongly disagree with each other on that, because I, you know, my, my interpretation of that act, which gives you the powers to do things, is that you've not met those tests, but we're clearly not going to agree on that. So um, yeah, I think start for us both. Well, I'm sure it can. I'm sure it can improve as we <laughs> go along. Um, uh, and I think others may wish to come in at this point, convener. Okay, Mr. High. Thank you, uh, convener, and welcome, welcome, minister. Given that this, if you go down the route that that it appears likely, may be the last opportunity that we have to question the government in, in detail on the application and the operation of this scheme. Um, just for the, for the public who might be watching, could you say what data specifically, what specific data an individual will have to disclose in order to apply for a COVID passport? The, the data will be the data that you've actually already got on NHS Scotland with regard to your double vaccination. That will be it. Uh, it's a QR code that effectively there will be no data going backwards and forwards. It will just be the equivalent of a green tick, as in you've double vaccinated. Will that include a photograph? As far as I, I'll need to get back to you on that one, but I wouldn't think so, but I'd need to double check that one for you. OK, so given that then that QR code and, and the data will be read by a third party device, that's right. So it will be the bouncer or, or the, the, the person at the doors. Am, am I correct? That's, that's my understanding. I would, the best way to explain it would be very similar to uh, modern football matches. Uh, my interpretation of it would be where effectively there is a barcode or QR code when you go through your ticket and you put it through the turnstile now and you get accessibility and uh, there's a handheld devices as well that are available to do that. So uh, the information when you're doing that, it's already technology that's already used on a regular basis. So uh, when that happens at a football game, nobody's data and, uh, goes transferring over other than what's held by the, if it's a season ticket with the club itself. That's about gaining entry to a match, but obviously that's a re requirement to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. But in these circumstances, I'm the bouncer, mm -hmm. you're seeking to come in to my nightclub. How can I confirm that you are who you say you are and that you are the person 
who has the double vaccine. What, what appears on my screen to give me that assurance? It will be your QR code, and your QR code will be secure in so much that you'll be the one that will be there. You know, uh, I, I don't... I, I know Mr Simpson said that he'd managed to gerrymander a QR code last week, uh, but uh, I don't believe uh, that would be the case. It would be the case that you would have your own one. It's very similar to... Uh, again, we all have been using QR codes to a certain degree with regards to checking into hospitality venues at the moment, where uh, the detail uh, that's gone over there is the fact that George Adam has appeared at this pub or this restaurant at this time, and that's been it. But you're appearing in the pub, you're simply recording the fact you've been there. What I'm wanting to know is how does that bouncer know that, who, that you are who you say you are and that you have the, the double vaccine? What specifically appears on his screen? Because it couldn't be a green tick, because then I could take your phone mm -hmm. and, and go with it. What specifically appears on his screen to give, or her screen, to give them the assurance that you are who you say you are and that you've been double vaccinated? What I'll do, Mr Hoy, is I'll take away the actual question, the detail of what you've got, and I'll get you a more detailed answer so that I can put your mind at rest with regards to this anyway. I'll bring this back to the committee, if that's OK. OK, finally, I, I think by this stage, probably ministers should be aware of how, how the system functions, but, but we will leave that. But just on the back of that question, therefore, I mean, have you in any way assessed that the system you're about to introduce is compliant with GDPR legislation? I would assume it would be to comply with GDPR. I think we probably need more than an assumption at this stage. Well, I think I think you're just being a bit of a rascal there, Mr Hoy, because I think government wouldn't do anything illegal. OK. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Mr Simpson? Yeah. Thanks again, convener. I, I just want to follow up on that, um, uh, because I'm a football fan like you, and if I go to a, a football match, I, I show somebody at the gate, my QR code, he or she scans it into their personal mobile phone, which is what it will be, that's what the government said last week, put their personal mobile phone. My concern is that my name, address and date of birth could show up on that person's personal mobile phone. And that to me is a breach of my, my data. Again, I would say my answer to Mr Hoy, the government will not do anything that will breach uh, any law or GDPR. But would you accept that would be a breach of my data? But it's a, it's a nonsense question, with great respect, Mr Simpson, because uh, I, I don't believe that you're going to end up in a situation where, you know, I could walk out in the street and get knocked down by a bus, but then again, I might not get knocked down by that bus. I might cross the road safely. I think you are just uh, speculating just a wee bit too much there speculating because we don't actually know but you've said you'll write to us with mm -hmm. with the details i'll move on convener if that's okay um to another uh, item which uh, you actually mentioned uh, earlier on that so that's the need for clarity um when 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 you lay uh, instruments um we had a, a very interesting discussion at committee recently um around what constitutes uh, dancing uh, because you'll recall um, that if you are dancing uh, in a nightclub, and of course we haven't got a proper de definition of a nightclub yet, uh, let alone dancing, uh, but if you are dancing, you don't have to wear a mask. Um, but there was no clear definition of what dan dancing actually is. Um, the government came back to us and said, well, if it's, you know, it's a form of exercise, so if you, you know, it'll fall under or fall under that um, description, uh, in which case, uh, as Craig Hoy mentioned at the same meeting, you could be dancing in a supermarket aisle um, and take your mask off. So that, that, that's why there's a, a need for clarity. I wonder if you've uh, defined what is meant by dancing yet. I, I think uh, at the end of the day, I think we all know what dancing is and what dancing going to a nightclub is. I know yourself and Mr Kidd had quite a... Uh, discussion with regards to what constituted dancing and I've seen Mr Kidd dance myself right enough and that's something that maybe defies a definition in itself uh, but uh, at the end of the day I, I think when people are going to a nightclub and then they go on to the dance floor and they start doing whatever they do men of our age uh, it's known as dad dancing uh, but uh, effectively when they do go onto that dance floor that constitutes some 
dancing on uh, in the floor there, and they would take their masks off. I think we're dancing in ahead of a thin pin with regards to this one. There is actually a need for clarity, which I agree. We need to be clear at all times, but at the same time, I think we have to use a bit of common sense uh, when we're talking about a lot of this as well. And uh, I think uh, most of the young people who will be going to the dancing, uh, oh, that was a very Ouija term I used there, the dancing, uh, and, uh, but uh, we, they, would, they would understand what constituted uh, dancing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're making I don't think you could do it in a shop. I don't think you could just take your mask off and start dancing in the middle of a store. Uh, well, this, the, this, this was the problem with the way the law was framed, and that's why we, why we raised it. I mean, we're, hap we're, we're joking about it, but it, it's a serious matter that when we write law, it needs to make sense and it needs to be understood, uh, and, and the, there shouldn't be loopholes. I understand the need for clarity, but as I say, there's common sense as well, which uh, someone taking a mask off in the middle of a Tesco and having a wee dance to themselves, uh, I don't think constitutes the same as dancing in a nightclub. Well, OK. Um, right, I'll move on to my uh, well, final for now. I've got some more questions later. Um, we've highlighted, uh, and again, this is something you mentioned uh, earlier on, we're not persuaded by some of the reasoning provided by the Scottish Government for breaching the 28-day rule for negative instruments. So. Can you sort of expand on what work you're doing to ensure that such breaches are only made when absolutely necessary? Mr Simpson, I, I spend most of my life uh, reminding my colleagues of various regulations like this in so much as uh, with the 28-day period, and it's serious, and I tell them how it should be avoided at all costs, because if I'm honest with you, Mr Simpson, I don't want to be coming to committee uh, to you for something that is effectively, it should just be natural for us to do it within the timelines. I find it irritating myself, uh, but there's some times where it has been unavoidable. Uh, we'll probably agree to differ whether that was unavoidable or not, but uh, there are times when that is unavoidable. And uh, But I, I do agree with the need for us to get better and to continue getting better with that uh, approach with the 28 day breaches, because uh, for me it's a process and we should just do the process. Thanks, Convener. Okay, no problem, thank you. Uh, Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Minister, I uh, can I ask you a couple of questions, please, about secondary legislation stemming from the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Um, so prior to the UK leaving the EU, the previous Minister, um, as has been mentioned, regularly updated the committee, uh, and on a number of occasions he talked about the volume of secondary legislation required to fix any legislative deficiencies um, which stem from the withdrawal from the EU. So can I ask, um, in terms of legislation arising from the UK leaving the EU, can you provide an estimate of the number of SSIs which require to be laid under the European Union Withdrawal Act to deal with the consequences of the withdrawal? Yeah, as in general terms, I expect the EU exit-related SSIs to remain relatively low compared to what they were at the peak, because uh, Mr Simpson and uh, the convener will be aware that there was a period where that was literally all you were dealing with uh, in here. And uh, I expect about 18 Scottish EU exit-related SSIs to up until the end of December, but this could be subject to change. But since 2019, there's, uh, we've laid 74 Scottish EU exit-related SSIs, and uh, I can expect to see further Scottish EU exit-related uh, SSIs during 2022, but there won't be anywhere near the number that we've had in the past. So there should be a, re a slowing down? Uh, there uh, should be a reduction in them. Reduction, yeah. Uh, so sent notifications for UK SIs are only considered by subject committees. How many SI notifications would you estimate will be sent to the Parliament under SI Protocol 2 between now and the end of this year? Probably about 22 re remaining uh, UK notifications for the, before the end of this year. Right. Just to answer your question very quickly. Right, well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, well, I mean, is that, is that a slowdown as well then? Is that sort of yes, uh -huh, in uh, general. Sorry. Compared to the uh, previous uh, committee, I think, the, the two members that have been here previously will know the kind of the, the general uh, 
and that volume of uh, SSIs they got relate to you when it was going through. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Sweeney. Thank you. Um, nice to see you. Uh, so, um, I suppose we're just trying to get a feel for what the forward workload is going to be and be able to anticipate as best possible future um, SSIs in relation to non-COVID aspects of legislation. So, how would the Scottish Government be pri pri prioritising non-COVID instruments to ensure that the necessary SSIs are still laid and scrutinised by the Parliament in a timely manner? Well, we, we continually aim to analyse and prioritise uh, the legislative programme, taking into account the Scottish Government's legal and policy capacity and parliamentary scrutiny capacity as well. Uh, this has helped us avoid having to continue to stop and start the legislative programme to avoid peaks and troughs. And as you'll be aware, there's a, uh, we tend to, in general with SSIs, not to try to put too many through the system at the one time in order to make sure that it can uh, balance itself out over the period. Because, uh, well, this committee would be extremely busy if we just did it all in the one time. OK. Um, I suppose what... One aspect of this sort of dynamic that we consider is packages of SSIs and groupings um, in relation to specific bills that have passed. There have been significant pieces of legislation that have passed in recent years, such as the Social Security Act Scotland 2018, the Transport Scotland Act 2019, and they have a significant number of delegated powers because they're quite complex pieces of legislation, obviously. Um, so it would be useful for this committee in order to plan its forward workload, um, and as well as the relevant subject matter committees, um, to be given advance notice Given and these are just two examples, do you have any sets? Of, do you know if there's any sets of instruments in the pipeline? And are you able to keep us updated on that progress? Given these are particularly landmark pieces of legislation. So, Sweeney, I know about this because you recently brought this up with my officials at the, or all of you did, the committee did at the uh, recent business planning session that you had. And uh, I'm happy to take an undertaking that, as part of our uh, profile of future legislation, we'll seek to identify significant packages of bill implementation and SSIs. I can also provide some information today, just to answer your question. Uh, a package of seven SSIs to implement redress for survivors, Historic Child Abuse and Care Act, split over September to November. Implementation of the Civil Partnership Act 2020 will see three SSIs in October and three in November. And the implementation of Disclosure Scotland Act 2020 will see two SSIs in November with more to follow. And the implementation of the Forensic Medical uh, Services uh, will begin in January. So uh, I'm, I'm keen to make sure this is a perfect example of I was already made aware that you had a, an issue with this and my officials were able to come to me and give me that detail so that I could bring it to you. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier on. The more we can have an open and frank uh, discussion, uh, I, there's things I can actually deal with and be able to give you the information you need. OK, thanks very much. Can I just ask, um, in relation to that, I mentioned two specific items of the legislation. You mentioned a series of bills um, that have now become acts and there will be delegated powers being drawn down. Um, in relation to the Social Security and Transport Acts, particularly because there are significant pieces of legislation, would you be able to give a commitment that you'll go back to your civil servants and ask them to consider when that might be coming forward and write to the committee to indicate when that is likely to be happening? Yeah. quite happy to do that and uh, try and give you the detail. That would be great. Appreciate it. Um, and also your, your predecessor tended to write to the subject committees as well at regular intervals um, to highlight the volume of SSIs that would be anticipated to fall within a period of time, uh, within you know, a six-month to 12-month period. Um, do you intend to continue that practice? Yes, I do, because I don't want to see Graham Day ever getting the better of me. <laughs> Fair enough. OK, uh, thank you, Mr Sweeney. Um, uh, Graham Simpson. Yeah, thanks again, convener. Uh, I mean, just, for, just following up on that, um, when we had a private meeting with uh, your officials, um, we did ask about the, uh, the area of questioning that Mr Sweeney's just covered, uh, and we specifically asked if the government could provide us with a list of outstanding regulations that flow from uh, acts which have, which have been passed. And I'm not sure we've seen that. So Mr Sweeney mentioned the Transport Act. Um, but there'll be a number of others. I think the planning, the planning act as well. I think there's still some stuff outstanding there. So I think it'd be useful just to have that 
that list if if we could have it uh, what i'll do is i'll i'll get my officials to make a troll of what's coming up what's available and uh, i'll share with you what i can mr simpson uh, at this stage uh, make sure i've got all the detail correct and okay. there's nothing that can be taken the wrong way right that, that'll be useful um Something just just on on that point, Minister, uh, it might be useful. Um, also, uh, traditionally, uh, I think you well, yourself or your predecessors have come into this committee maybe twice a year. Uh, it might be useful in the intervening period um, to write to the committee on a um, so for talking sake on a quarterly basis, uh, just to keep the committee updated in terms of what is coming down the line over the uh, that uh, next quarter. Would that be I'll look into possible? that for us and see what we can do then. Okay. You know? right, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Simpson. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'll move on to uh, discuss the Scottish Law Commission. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and you know the, the committee works very closely with the, the, the Law Commission, um, as, as do you. Um, but there's been a long-standing frustration from them and us, uh, particularly them, I would imagine, about the. the the amount of work they've done, the amount of reports they've done that have just stacked up and haven't resulted in legislation. Uh, in fact, they provided us with a, with a list and uh, I think there's about, there's about 18 um, Scottish Law Commission reports from dating from 2006, which haven't ended up uh, as legislation. Um, I mean, that covers things from electoral law to level crossings you know so there's all there's all kinds of very very serious work going on here um so they're very frustrated we were very frustrated and certainly in the last uh, session we worked with the parliament to put in a set of protocols that could allow this committee to take on more bills if they were presented uh, and that would that would actually help the parliament because it would get stuff through um, I think in the programme for government, you uh, said that you wanted uh, to do something on movable transactions. So when do you, when do you see legislation on that uh, being introduced? Uh, and do you see this being a bill which meets the criteria that might be considered by this committee? Uh, I would say on the Scottish Law Commission stuff, every, all your work in the legacy paper you did last time has been listened to. Uh, by government and has been taken on board because I know it has been an open source for your, for this committee for a wee while and for the Scottish Law Commission as well. So uh, the movable transaction uh, uh, will be probably, I would suggest, would be coming to this committee uh, we, we should, uh, should when we go forward to that. But also the programme for government uh, this year actually announced quite a few SLC uh, uh, kind of the, all, uh, bills to go through as well and I'd like to use that as an example Mr Simpson of us actually listening because I think this is actually a good news story you know we've listened to what the committee has said and we've uh, implemented it through the programme for government so uh, but the movable transactions I'll get the I, I, I've probably got the dates here somewhere but uh, I'll probably just to make sure I get them accurately to you I'll get that back to the committee at a later date I think trust law was, was the other one. Trust law, title conditions, contract law and judicial factors. Yeah. Okay. And you in, you anticipate them all coming this, this year? This uh, calendar year? Probably well within the next twelve months. Within the session of Parliament. Uh, I don't know the actual okay. dates. Okay. Um, so I, th I think it would be useful um, for the committee to actually have something from yourself about which SLC reports you anticipate bringing forward and which you don't, and then, then we know what we're working with. Okay, uh, fine to do. I'll give you the list of what we're actually doing uh, and take it from there. Okay. Thanks, Convene. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think just to, to make anyone uh, watching aware that the, the letter um, that uh, has been referenced has now been published on the, uh, on the committee webpage this morning. Um, so if anyone is interested, then they'll be able to find the, the letter there. And th something just to, to make um, everyone aware, I, mean, I think the letter genuinely was extremely useful and, and the discussion we had um, prior to uh, the committee coming back in this session uh, was also extremely useful. I think there's a particular element of the, 
um, of the, the work of the SLC, which I think is, is certainly useful for people to understand, um, that from 1965 to December 2020, uh, of the 190 reports published uh, by the SLC, 158, that's 83%, have either been implemented in whole or in part and that 5%, 5 much 3%, have been superseded. Uh, but I think the point that Mr Simpson was raising, that 27, which is 14%, have not been implemented at all. Uh, but I think certainly just in terms of the, uh, the wider clarity of the, the role of the SLC and the work that the SLC undertake, I think just it's important for, for people to be uh, aware um, of that. Uh, and just a question uh, for myself, Minister, is regarding the, the Prescription Scotland Act 2018, um, that's yet to be commenced and the Scottish Government have consulted on the draft commencement regulations for the Act last year. Uh, when does the Scottish Government intend to lay these regulations? Uh, I don't have that level of detail with me today, so quite happy to get that back to you, talk to officials and get that back to you as well. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Mr Hoy. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just two brief questions, if, if I may, Minister. Um, from the bills highlighted in the programme for government, do you anticipate that any of them will have significant delegated powers? And do you think uh, it might be useful to highlight those to the committee at this time? Well, all the bills that we've, uh, we've announced in the programme for government will be interesting, obviously, in their own way. But at the moment, none of these bills seem to fit into the category of what are sometimes referred to as framework bills. Uh, however, I'm happy to uh, give the undertaking to keep this under review and come back to the committee should that position change and ensure that we do have this open dialogue that, you know, uh, basically no surprises from yourself. And in terms of specific powers of individual bill, I think it's too early to say at this point, but I'm happy again uh, to keep that under review and get back to you. And obviously a number of uh, previous uh, COVID-related uh, bills have been considered in, in, a, in a very short time frame, and that's perfectly understandable. But for the expected uh, coronavirus compensation for self-isolation bill, do you see this providing the committee with sufficient time to scrutinise any proposed delegated powers? I think inevitably with legislation connected to COVID, there will always be a need to, uh, to progress everything quickly. Uh, however, in relation to the Compensation for Self-Isolation Bill, I don't expect it will require to an emergency timetable and I expect this committee to have significant time to scrutinise uh, any delegated powers in it. Okay, thank you. Um, the colleagues, have any other questions for the Minister? Yeah, Mr Sweeney. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I was just keen to, to, to bring you back, Minister, to the, the correspondence from Charles Garland at the Scottish Law Commission, um, which was a really interesting session that we held with, with, the, with, with the gentleman, um, and in particular in relation to those 27 items of, of draft legislation that are kind of shovel-ready, if you like. Um, would it be possible for yourself to perhaps commission a review of those 27 items and just assess actually are these opportunities that the government could bring forward in a time a timely manner um or as something that the committee had mentioned was actually they could be sponsored by members as a through the ngbu um as private as members bills and perhaps use that as an alternative route to achieving that because i think there's, a, there's a, definitely a national interest in having that body of work carried forward as quickly as possible um, so it might be useful to do a sort of assessment at this point of that archive of material and, and see what opportunities there are. And if that could be written you know, in the form of writing to this committee, perhaps, just to see what the government's view is on those 27 items, that would be quite a useful exercise, I think. We, uh, we could probably come back with uh, the position on that to you with the detail. Uh, but just to continue about the SLC's uh, uh, the, the letter, uh, the stuff that they mentioned about trust law, to use that as an example, you know, I understand the Minister for Community Safety will shortly write to Lady Payton on this bill, so we'll, we'll be able to kind of take that one forward, and uh, I think it's reasonable for the committee to infer the reference to the SLC's trust law report and the programme for government, so all in the whole, what I'm trying to say, I'm going roundabout circles here, what I'm trying to say, I'm taking on board seriously that we need to find a way. 
as Minister for Parliamentary Business, I'm not too keen in too many members' business uh, uh, bills kicking about because I'm trying to manage the the five-year programme as we speak. So uh, if I can find a way that we can manage to manage some of the uh, SLC commitments that we've made and I'll look at some of the other stuff, then we'll do what we can. But as the convener has already stated, uh, the numbers aren't as bad uh, over the period, uh, although there's still some that are always left. Thank you, Minister. Any other questions, colleagues? No. Okay. Uh, so, and just to, uh, for the public record, also, Lady, Lady Payton from the SLC will be uh, in the committee uh, in two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. With that, um, uh, Minister, I'd like to thank you and your officials for the evidence that you provided, and, uh, and certainly uh, there may well be some. Uh, I know that there are one or two action points from yourself. Uh, but also there might be some other questions uh, from the committee when we have our discussion later that we uh, might want to write to you on. Uh, so there might be some further correspondence coming uh, from the committee. Happy to have this open dialogue and make sure we can get a lot of the work that we will be doing together is stuff that we should just be able to get the process right and do it. Okay, thank you. And certainly thank we all look forward to working with you and your officials uh, in the term ahead. I don't know about my officials right enough because... I've only been here the day. <laughs> so. well, well, they were virtual somewhere. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, I will suspend uh, the meeting and uh, we will reconvene in a few moments. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The uh, next item of business is consideration of instruments subject to the made affirmative procedure. An issue has been raised on Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Scotland Amendment No. 17 Regulations 2021, SSI 2021-301. Regulation 4B inserts a new paragraph 9 into Regulation 5F of the International Travel Regulations. Paragraph 9 provides for the definition of private provider in respect of COVID-19 Day 2 and Day 8 test providers. As currently drafted paragraph 9b, it refers to private Day 2 and Day 2 test providers, and this should refer to private Day 2 and Day 8 test providers. The Scottish Government advised this would be rectified in a forthcoming amend amending instrument. SSI 2021-307 was laid before the Parliament on Friday the 10th of September and includes provision rectifying this error. This instrument will be considered by the Committee in due course. Our members content to report the instrument under the general reporting ground due to a typographical error in Regulation 4B of the instrument, whilst at the same time noting that the Scottish Government have since rectified the error. Thank you. Uh, no points have been raised on SSI 2021-299. Uh, Is the committee content with this instrument? Yeah. Under agenda item number four, we're considering instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the following draft instruments. The Animal Welfare Licensing of Activities Involving Animals, Scotland, Amend Regulations 2021. The Redress for Survivors Historical Child Abuse in Care, Scotland Act 2021, uh, Form and Content of Waiver etc. Regulations 2021, and the Forestry Exemptions Scotland Amendment Regulations 2021. Is the Committee content with these instruments? Yes, yes. Okay. An SSI was laid by the Scottish Government very late in the day yesterday. It's the Draft Social Security Residence Requirements Afghanistan Scotland Regulations 2021. The Department for Work and Pensions is introducing regulations to allow those evacuated from Afghanistan to have immediate access to social security assistance where they enter the UK. This SSI has been laid to ensure a parity of access to benefits 
and for which Scottish ministers have responsibility. The Scottish Government is seeking to have these changes come into force tomorrow. While in the very limited time available, no points have been raised on the instrument, uh, I reserve the right for the committee to look at the instrument again next week, should any uh, issues sub subsequently be found. We could then write to the Scottish Government to highlight these. We are taking all that into account. Is the committee content with this instrument? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Under the next agenda item, we are considering an instrument subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI's 2021-302. Uh, Is the committee content with this instrument? Yes, yeah. okay. Under agenda item number six, we are considering instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSI's 2021, 291 and 295. Is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. I will now move the committee into private.